Well, 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 happy Friday. We did it. We made it through another week. And as you guys know, we have a little tradition on the cult where Friday is happy hour. And on happy hour, we kick back, we drink some beer, and we do what we usually do every day, which is we watch a woke training from start to finish and we talk about it. Now, this week has been a little bit different. You know, bought like... I actually was expecting there to be some sort of Easter beer when I went to the beer store today, but I didn't see any Easter beer. I don't know. The Christians, per usual, you know, they ruin everything. They don't even make any Easter beer. Whatever. We do have some pretty good ones, though. I'm actually pretty excited about the uh, the selection today, and you guys are going to get a chance to vote on which beer I drink first in a minute. But gosh, has it been a weird week? It's been less a week about socialism and fighting back against the left as it has been about the ever-evolving and changing definition of what anti-Semitism means. I, I feel like I was thinking about this because I've been like, I've been writing articles in my head for my Substack all week about the changing definition of anti-Semitism. And then I'm like, Carlin, that shit's going to get you canceled. And I'm like, but I'm just documenting what people are saying. And I haven't been posting on the Substack. It's like, really, this is like all that's in my head is like this anti-Semitism bullshit. And by the way, it's not just like both sides are trying to hijack the definition of anti-Semitism. The left has tried to hijack the definition of anti-Semitism. The right is also trying to hijack the definition of anti-Semitism. Nick Fuentes has now been banned off of Twitter in a week, which I was very upset about. I was not happy about it. Twitter is so much better when Nick Fuentes is on it. He causes all sorts of problems. He gets everyone all riled up. It is a, it is actually incredible. It is it is actually incredible what that kid is able to do. Like think about it. Nick Fuentes last week la- like he returned to Twitter last Friday. It's only been one week of this. And within a week On Twitter, Nick Fuentes gained over 25,000 Twitter followers on a sock account that had not that did not have his name on it, was involved in one of the most epic Twitter spaces of all time that I just happened to be involved in too, but that was just good luck. Where we got the Daily Wire to just like say the quiet part out loud over and over and over and over and over again. The Daily Wire is going into full on fucking meltdown over the fact that their allegiance to Israel has been revealed. We learned last night, and if you didn't see this last night, you can catch the uh, clip that I put on my channel today. This clip right here, Daily Wire employees reveal why Candace Owens was fired. Apparently, the Daily Wire struggle sessioned all of their staff to make them think that Candace Owens was anti-Semitic so that their staff would hate Candace Owens just as much as Ben Shapiro does. And Andrew Clavin did this whole public ordeal where he was like, it is anti-Semitic to not believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. It is anti- Andrew Clavin actually said that it is anti-Semitic to say Christ is king to a Jewish person. And then we had the whole Crowder ordeal. It's just been a weird week, man. It's been a full week. There's been a lot of drama. So whatever. Sometimes we have these weird weeks. You can't, you can't, you can't like, you can't anticipate this stuff. You just have to go with the flow. You just have to roll with the punches as it were. But I think I might have found something to just top the week off. With like a really, a, a nice bow. A nice bow. Well, definitions matter. Here's the other thing that's going on. Now the conservative right is tripping over themselves. Oh God, I even forgot. I even forgot about the rap. This, this week has been so crazy that I forgot that we watched Alex Jones debate Rabbi Shmuley. That was like a whole other crazy thing. But back to back to back to this one. The entire conservative right that still is like 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 this guy, I promise you. I and I don't know you. You're new to my channel, so I'm going to use you as an example and you just got to get used to it if you're going to hang around here. P 
People like this are desperate to cling on to the idea that the Daily Wire is an ethical organization and not a propaganda outlet. And so now they're saying, sometimes Christ is King can be anti-Semitic, but sometimes it's not anti-Semitic too. And it's kind of like, bro, do you guys have any self-awareness at all? Because the Daily Wire is literally the organization that's been running around going, what is a woman? 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 Okay, so you guys can demand a definition for the term woman, but we cannot have one consistent definition of the term anti-Semitic. Yeah, sometimes trees can be anti-Semitic. Sometimes dogs can be anti-Semitic. Sometimes a dirty look can be anti-Semitic. It really is all about, it's not about intent, it's about impact. Where have I heard that before? Someone help me. Where have I heard that before? Sometimes cereal can be racist. Sometimes ice hockey can be racist. Sometimes sometimes, t sometimes uh, trees can be racist. Sometimes Gandhi can be racist. It's, and it's not about intent. It's all about impact. It's all about moi, feelings. It's almost like the Daily Wire and the conservatives who are currently chilling for the Daily Wire are woke as AF. I'm trying to swear less. Woke AF. But we're not going to talk about any of that right now. If you found me because of the stream last night or the drama content that I've been doing this week and you're new to my channel, welcome. Glad you're here. We're going to do something a little bit different, though. When we're going to go back to our roots. We're going to go back to what we normally do right now, which is we're going to watch a woke training. And I found a, I, I found a really good woke training that we're going to watch today. I'm actually really excited about this. Check this out. I found a presentation on some woman's random YouTube channel. I don't know who Kendrick Kim is. I know if I go to Kendrick Kim's YouTube channel... There's, uh, you know, less a couple hundred subscribers. It really looks like it's all old. Lots of like random stuff. Looks a little socialist. A lot of, lot of random stuff going on. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is a person I'm following, but I found on their YouTube channel a presentation called Chosen Family, understanding the chosen kin community as a model for liberation. Well, that sounds a little socialist, doesn't it? But the thing that really got my attention was this in the background. Unapologetic, fighting for the liberation of queer, transgender, and non-binary students. And this was at an event back in 2022, so it's a little bit old. CCC LGBTQ plus summit. What do you think that is? What do you think that is? The CCC LGBTQ plus summit. I'm going to show you what it is. But first, I'm going to take the super chat from Rottweiler. Shapiro quit Breitbart for being too populist with Bannon and co-founded the Daily Wire, which isn't populist. They don't care about you. Yeah, they don't care about you. The Daily Wire doesn't care about you conservatives. They never have. Let me show you what this is. So I did a little search. CCC LGBTQ Summit. I found this. The Foundation for California Community Colleges. Oh, ha, 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 ha. So you're telling me the CCC LGBTQ Plus Summit? which seems to be an annual event, has something to do with the Foundation for California Community Colleges. The last time I checked, community colleges were taxpayer-funded. I don't know if this Foundation for California Community Colleges is taxpayer-funded, but community colleges in general are taxpayer funded. And I'm going to bet you anything with the term foundation 
in the title is going to be a nonprofit. Help Foundation CCC further its mission to benefit, support, and enhance the California community colleges. I don't know exactly what this organization is, but it kind of seems to me like this could be funded by the taxpayer dollar. And I would be I would be shocked to high heaven if it wasn't funded at minimum, at minimum by state funded grants. Something to look into later. But I did notice something rather exciting when I was researching this. And you're all going to be excited about this. The sixth annual California Community Colleges LGBT Plus Summit will be held virtually in April. This year's summit is free for attendees. Logistics information, the California Community Colleges. Oh, this is within the, okay, now I know what this is now. I know what this is now. It's it's within the chancellor's office for the California Community Colleges. The chancellor's office is what oversees all of the community colleges in California. So I may have registered for the summit, not under my real name, of course. We'll get a couple other people to register for the summit, also probably not under their real names. And we're spy streaming that shit. We're spy streaming that shit. And, I, and I'll tell you when it is, too. I'm, I'm just going to tell I'm going I'm to just announce flat out we're doing this and there's nothing they can really do about it. It's called Rise, Resist and Empower. It is Wednesday, April 24th through Thursday, April 25th. The Unstoppable Movement for Queer and Trans Liberation. Oh, my word. <laughs> I'm getting hot just thinking about this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but how exciting. How exciting that today, just because some random woman happened to upload this presentation to a YouTube channel, we get to have a little sneak peek of what we're getting into when we do eventually spy stream that California University Colleges Summit. You guys ready? Well, we can't get into it just yet because I need some beer. I need some beer first. And so on happy hour, what we do is I go to the beer store and I get four beers. And prior to starting the presentation, we vote on which one I drink first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about the four beers I picked up. And if you're drinking anything fun, please make sure you do put it in the chat. As always, guys, please do make sure you mount that like button for me. Please make sure you are subscribed on whatever platform you're watching on. I appreciate it. This is why Elle said that about Carlin. Yes, what Elle said about me is I find shit that no one else finds. Every single time, every single time, every single time. It is beer o'clock. So let's see. First beer I have. I'm actually very excited about this beer. This is called Picnic. It's from Henniker Brewing Company. It is 5.2% uh, alcohol, and it is a strawberry rhubarb sour. I love rhubarb beer. Rhubarb beer is so good. It's, like, very crisp, very summery. Like, it's pretty warm out right now. Um, so I think this could be a good beer. Let's see. This series pays, pays homage to the tradition of picnicking. The strawberry rhubarb sour ale is a symphony of tartness and refreshment. Whether basking in the warmth of the sun or seeking refuge in the shade of a towering tree, grab your beer and your blanket. It's time for a picnic. That's going to be option number one, strawberry rhubarb sour. Option number two, I have no idea how to pronounce this brewing company's name, but the, 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 the can is pretty cool. Uh, uh, um, uh, Omnium. We're going to go with that. Omnium Brewing Company. This is called Cherry Quencher. And this is a fruited sour, and this is 7.3% alcohol. This is out of Summersworth, New Hampshire, so New Hampshire beer. Cheers for that. I don't really see any descriptor, but the, the can has lots of cherries on it. It's very pretty. It's a pretty can. I appreciate a good beer can design. So that's going to be option number two, cherry quencher. Option number three, I feel like this is like a leftover from uh, the winter beers, but I didn't. I don't recall seeing it at the time. This is called Gigantic Gingerbread. 
It is an 8% imperial, and it's an imperial gingerbread ale with cinnamon, ginger, and molasses. And it's from Imperial Brewing Company. Let's see. Any sort of like little blurb? Let's see. Gigantic gingerbread is back, featuring biscuit and honey malts with layers of molasses, ginger, uh, cinnamon, and vanilla. This inspired ale brings back memories. What the fuck does that say? Memories of decorating gingerbread cookies on a snowy day. Cheers, everyone, for our holdover winter beer, gingerbread. And our last one, I've had this one before, but I couldn't help myself. I had to pick it up because I, I don't always see it in the beer store, and I really like it. This is called Peanut Butter Cookie Porter with Lactose. Anytime you have a lactose beer, it's going to be a little bit creamier, a little bit milkier. It's going to be more of like a dessert beer. And this is from us. This is called Snack Time. Let's see. I'm, I'm getting to that stage in my life where I have to take my glasses off to actually read. It's just called Snack Time. A Rock the Barrel collaboration. And it is a peanut butter cookie porter with lactose. So those are our options. Let me get my glasses back on. There they go. I'm going to put the poll in the chat on YouTube. Again, you guys get to vote on which one I drink first. Are we doing strawberry rhubarb? Are we doing cherry? Are we doing gingerbread? Or are we doing peanut butter cookie? Let me know. Let me know in the chat. In the meantime, just a couple more orders of business. Number one, if if you haven't checked out some of the streams I've been doing this week, because I know it's been a little bit of a crazy week, I do have a couple of clips up. I definitely encourage everyone to watch those Daily Wire clips just to get a sense of like what we're getting into, because like I really do think it's important in terms of like understanding who's influencing people. Because it's so effed up. So I definitely want to encourage everyone to check that out. I also want to encourage people to please, if you are not subscribed to me on Rumble, I know I've got some people watching on Rumble right now, um, but if you're watching on X or you're watching on YouTube and you have not subscribed to me on Rumble, please make sure you do so. Listen, let me just put the link in the chat. I know some. I know the chat is usually better over on YouTube, so I know a lot of people hang out on YouTube, but I'm just going to put the link in the chat. And just in case... Because you never know what's going to happen, guys. You really never know. I could lose my YouTube channel. I don't think I will. But I could one day wake up and find I no longer have a YouTube channel. We always want to make sure we have backups upon backups upon backups. So please just make sure you are subscribed to me over on Rumble. I would really, really appreciate it. And last thing, please make sure if you want to support the work I'm doing, in addition to subscribing to my Substack, which I haven't been posting to this week because it's been a crazy week. I'm sorry for the lack of Substack content. I really, really am. Make sure you subscribe to my Substack at carlin.substack.com, but also make sure you head over to the Unwoke Art Merchandise Store because there's a couple items in the Unwoke Art Merch Store. They're going to be leaving uh, in the next couple of days, going to be uh, leaving at the end of the day on Sunday. The first is the epic Make McCarthyism Great Again design. That is a limited edition design that will only be in the store for a couple more days. You can get it on a t-shirt, on hoodies, on sweatshirts, even on shot glasses. So you can check that out. You can also get the March limited edition Unwoke Wiki design. So that's going to be leaving the store um, in a couple of days as well, because we're going to be transitioning over to a new design for April. So this is the tarot card uh, Plague Doctor, which I think is really badass and epic. And on the back, it points people to the Unwoke Wiki, which is a project that we're working on building out, documenting all of this stuff. And of course, like this stuff does all go to fund the work I'm doing, which I really, really appreciate. You can get lots of other stuff in the Unwoke Art Store, too. Let's go to, go to the T-shirt section, see what we have there. You can get the real Marxism shirt, which is one of my favorites. You can get the 1984 shirt. You can get the Javier Malay shirt. You can even, if you're feeling a little spicy and you want to make a, con a comment on cancel culture, you could even get the megalomaniac blue octopus taking over the world shirt, which of course is representative of cancel culture. And all the bullshit forms that cancel culture takes. 
and the printing on it looks really good. It honestly did come out really good. I'm really happy with the design of that shirt. I was wearing it just the other day. So those are just some of the items available in the Unwoke Art Store, and you can go and peruse that for yourself. I do hope to be doing an update to the store soon. I'm going to be releasing a whole bunch of sticker packs and stuff like that. So you can get multiple of like the stickers all in one sheet, or you can get like, uh, I'm working on a big sticker project for the store. Anyway, people have been requesting the stickers. I want, I've been wanting to do it for a long time. That's going to be coming to the store. I was just, I was just saying that bill. Okay. I apologize. It has been a crazy fucking month. Okay. <laughs> But we will be launching some new sticker stuff in the Unwoke Art Store, um, hopefully uh, at the beginning of April. Fingers crossed. All right. All right. Let me see this poll. What what beer won? Holy shit. I'm actually surprised by that. Strawberry rhubarb. You guys went with the strawberry rhubarb. I was not expecting that as the choice. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Let's pour the beer and then we will get started with our presentation. And if you're, again, if you're drinking something fun, let us know what you're drinking in the chat. I'm actually pretty grateful, you guys. I, I wanted to drink this one. I just didn't think I was going to get to drink it until tomorrow for uh, Socialism Saturday. Now every, every hater on the internet is going to be like, Carlin's an alcoholic because she's having a beer on the internet. Cheers, everyone. Happy Friday. You know what? This is great. This is like one of those things that you just want to be like out of the beach or something, or you just want to be like hanging out at a barbecue or like, it's just like one of those beers that is just like so crisp and so clean and so light. It's just delightful. It's delightful. Excellent way to start the show. All right, let's get into this presentation. And what we're going to be learning about is the chosen family. Queering the family. Let's see what they had to say. Um, I am the moderator today for the session. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few items to share with you. My eyes are gonna be over here because I'm reading the script. Um, please note that we are in a Zoom meeting and that you have full access to your, uh, to your video and audio and microphone capabilities. Please be mindful of the presenters and other attendees in this session and stay on mute or mute yourself when not actively asking a question or sharing when prompted by the presenters. Should you have questions or comments otherwise, please enter them into the chat box. As time allows, we will share your questions with the presenters and they may monitor as well. Additionally, you may use the chat feature to share thoughts with the presenters and with each other. The session Thank listening you, Honest Dog Gal. I'm going to check that out. I appreciate you and all, all the work you're doing. The app also includes a short survey at the end of the listing. We ask that you complete the survey at the end of the session as it is important feedback for the planning uh, for planning purposes. Thank you for being with us and enjoy the session. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Um, uh, Tim Gutierrez, Assistant Professor. Dee Deborah Brown, Assistant Professor of History and Ethnic Studies. Uh, Professor Brian Keen, Professor Wendy Silva, and Professor Robert Heyer, um, and everyone is here representing Riverside uh, City College, which is very exciting. So, Riverside um, City College. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for that intro. Um, so we're gonna, excuse me, uh, my name is uh, Robert Hires, um, he, him pronouns. Um, we're gonna uh, get started with the presentation. Yep, this was the 2022 conference. All right. Pop quiz for the chat. What does this mean? Chosen family, understanding the chosen kin community as a model for liberation. What does that mean? Let me know. Let me know what you've learned. Show me you are smarter than James Lindsay's audience. For the love of God, please show me you're smarter than James Lindsay. Like, fingers crossed. Chosen family, understanding the chosen kin community is a model for liberation. Ch uh, communal family, not the nuclear family. Chosen family equals being part of the collective. Living a communal life, not biological. Collectivizing childcare. Destroying the nuclear family, abandoning blood family for non-biological family, collectivism, 
the family of the collective. This is what we exactly this is what replaces the nuclear family. We know that the left wants to abolish the nuclear family because they believe the nuclear family upholds capitalism, which is defined as private property ownership. And so so they've got to replace it with something. And the chosen family or a family that is not based on kinship is what they want to replace it with. The collective, not the real family, collectivism, your circle of queer buddies, undoing the nuclear family in order to support the destruction of capitalism. That exactly everyday therapist, anytime you see the term liberation, they mean liberate oneself from capitalism. That is what that means. The chosen family is the collective as opposed to the nuclear family. Your account's not beating hidden. We can see you. Queer community liberating from capitalism. Taking away parental rights in pursuit of child liberation. Yup. Non-biological family outside the nuclear family and the gender binary. The nuclear family is oppressive because it forces capitalism, the gender binary, and in paid, uh, unpaid labor versus being able to pick your family based on whatever, uh, whatever friendship. Exactly. This is about the queering of the heteronormative culture through uh, outside kinship. Exactly. Well done, guys. Well done. All right. So, uh, so. Our presentation title, uh, Chosen Family, Understanding the Chosen Kin Community as a Model for Liberation. Right, and we're gonna get started here with uh, Dr. Gutierrez. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Tim Gutierrez, he, him, I teach sociology. And I wanted to, to start just by pointing out the old news that the nuclear family is in crisis. Uh, it's also important to remember that it's the nuclear family in crisis, not the concept. Look at the slide. The nuclear family is in crisis. Hang on. I need to, I, I, I took a cough drop. Hang on. I thought I was being so smart by trying to chew my cough drop and then I needed to say something. Con so they're flat out telling us. This is for all the James Lindsay stands who do not understand this because James Lindsay has never taught. This it, holy shit! This slide is so beautiful. Can we just take a moment to relish that this slide teaches everything about abolish the family that I've been saying for the last two fucking years? The nuclear family is constructed to serve the needs of capitalism, which is defined as private property ownership. It centers. Heteronormativity, heteronormativity is another word for capitalism. Patriarchy, patriarchy is another word for capitalism. And whiteness, which is another word for capitalism. And is increasingly failing to fulfill the emotional, cultural, and economic needs of those who live within it. It's almost as though every single time I'm asked by conservatives, Carlin, if the left wants to destroy capitalism and the nuclear and destroying the nuclear family is all about destroying capitalism, then why don't they ever say capitalism? They do say capitalism. They say capitalism not one, not two. Not three, but four different ways in the same sentence. And guess what? Does anyone see anything in this slide about a, a Gnostic sex cult? Do you guys see Gnostic sex cult? No. The reason you do not see Gnostic sex cult is because queer Marxism or queer theory is not about a Gnostic sex cult, no matter how many books James Lindsay and Logan Lansing write about it. It has nothing to do with a Gnostic sex cult. Queer theory is about attacking the gender binary. Another term for the gender binary is the patriarchy because they believe that capitalism created the gender binary or the patriarchy, um, which created the nuclear family. The nuclear family upholds capitalism through social reproduction theory. That's why they want to destroy the gender binary and the nuclear family. 
which they're saying on this slide. Just go back. We're going to get started here with uh, Dr. Gutierrez. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim Gutierrez. He, him. I teach sociology. And I wanted to, to start just by pointing out the old news that the nuclear family is in crisis. Uh, it's also important to remember that it's the nuclear family in crisis, not the concept of family entirely. So the nuclear family is that restrictive family model that consists of two differently gendered adults in a fertile monogamous relationship living together and raising their biological children. So in other words, a monogamous heterosexual couple and their offspring living together. And that nuclear family vision was constructed to fit the needs of a capitalist, heteronormative, patriarchal and white supremacist society. It was built in the 19th and 20th century for an industrialized capitalist system. Oh, one person stays at home to do the unpaid labor. Oh, so the other can work as many paid hours as possible. In sociology, we call this the, the breadwinner homemaker model. Uh, it's patriarchal because women are expected to stay home, work for free, and be economically dependent on men. It naturalizes a version of femininity as fixed and satisfied with this nurturing role and a version of masculinity that is fixed and that rejects care work in favor of taking care of business. Um, it's heteronormative because it naturalizes that differently gendered division of labor plus other pillars of heterosexuality like monogamy and separation of friendship and romantic relationships. Uh, it's part of white supremacy because it centers a family structure that's most common in white families and stigmatizes other types of families, whether they be extended or dispersed or single parent households or matriarchal structures, et cetera, that are more common in BIPOC and immigrant communities. Uh, these traditions have deep cultural and emotional significance, but are too often viewed as pathological because they deviate from this nuclear model. So as we can see from that leaked Roe v. Wade decision, like they're coming for all of our rights. They're trying to force everybody back into a head. Hang on, he, he's, he's going off in another. Can we, can we just all admit that that was beautiful? I'm going to clip that later. Don't worry about it. I'm going to clip all of this later. In fact, let me just get this. Uh, let me just grab this video to download so I can clip that later. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to download this just in case that random that random woman ever removes it from her YouTube channel. But that was everything I've been saying for two years. That was everything wrapped up in a nice little bow in a taxpayer funded presentation. You all just learned more about what the left believes about the nuclear family from this community college professor out in California than James Lindsay has ever taught his audience ever. Honest question, not meant to sound uneducated. We, we, we always take honest questions here, T-Bone man. No, don't worry about it. What keeps a biological argument revolving around the necessity of, bio of biological parentage from being effective against these points? Because they don't care. They don't care. They believe, the woke left believes that the children should belong to the community. They believe in an alternate form. They So, so you saying like, it's a bio. The woke left doesn't believe in biology, bro. That when they teach classes in queer biology, Google it. Don't believe me. Google it. Queer biology. They don't believe in biology. So if you go in and say, "Well, biology is a necessity," they're going to go, "We don't believe in biology." So you're not speaking to them on the same level. That's why. A normative patriarchal box, but the model they're trying to force us all into has been unraveling for decades. Even straight people are bailing on it. Next slide, please, Rob. So across sexualities and gender identities, people are increasingly seeking relationships of love and intimacy and care that exist beyond these heteronormative family structures. Uh, this is what uh, Judith Stacy and others have called queering the family. So this nuclear family model is not able to meet people's economic, cultural, or emotional needs. It was never intended to. Uh, capitalism has turned that breadwinner homemaker model into Ding. the dual earner model. All adults work outside the home to pay the rent, buy groceries, 
Women are expected to work the second shift for free, cooking and cleaning, bathing kids, et cetera. And you're expected to pay for childcare because you're gone all the time. Notice how much easier some of this care work would be with expanded family structures outside mm. of this box. Um, when there's less meaningful time together, people in family units have weaker bonds and get less emotional support. Uh, we're also less likely to feel fulfilled in our cultural needs because the need to hustle to survive alienates us from our communities and other nurturing spaces. So we call it queering the family, but even cishet people have been jumping ship and seeking relationships of love and care and intimacy that exist beyond heteronormative family structures. Uh, these living and loving relationships are diverse and fluid and constantly being chosen and rechosen. So as heteronormative coupling and reproduction are decentered, friendship networks and other forms of intimacy become more important in our everyday lives. And that fuels further questioning and reevaluation of the significance and investment that we place into romantic coupling. Uh, queer and trans uh, and even cishet people are increasingly seeking and uh, as Weeks writes, experiencing love as hang contingent. On. And hang on, hang on. Don't interpret, don't misinterpret what I said. I did not listen. T-Bone Man, I know you're relatively new here. We're going to teach you. It's all good, bro. But what I will say is that you need to listen to what I'm saying. I did not say an obsession with the self. No one in the chat said an obsession with the self. This is part of the problem. And I don't mean, to, I don't mean to like, I don't mean to, you know, single you out but you're an anonymous profile. We don't know who you are, so don't take this personally. Literally no one here said an obsession with the self. That's something that you created, that you put in there based on assumptions that you have made. Those assumptions are not correct. And this is part of the problem. The incorrect assumptions that people make about this that are not grounded into reality at all are what prevent people from actually understanding this. This is not about an obsession with the self. That is a conservative bullshit talking point. That is the same as saying they're all narcissists. It's just all narcissism. It's all narcissism. It's not. They have completely different values than you do. They believe that the world would be a better place if children had multiple sets of parents that were providing for their different needs. This is where the idea of it takes a village to raise a child comes from. They believe that children will be better taken care of. Also, that senior citizens will be better taken care of. If we, if we dispense with the model of the nuclear family. <clears throat> they believe that everyone will have access to greater resources. Of course, this is all bullshit. It's not real at all, but this is what they believe. And so I bring this up because people like to paint this. They like to paint the idea of the abolition of the nuclear family as something that is deep and sinister and grounded in narcissism. And just because they all hate their parents and just because they all don't have kids, none of that is real. Socialists have kids. Not all socialists hate their parents. This idea and the perpetuation of this idea is not about hating anyone. It is not about narcissism. It is not about self-obsession. Uh, self it is about having a fundamentally different set of values and how you see the world. They don't believe in biological kinship. Why do you think they would care about aunts and uncles? They don't believe in biological kinship. confluent and seeking to live sexual relationships in terms of a friendship ethic. So in other words, people want to choose their families. Uh, next slide, please. And that takes us to the, the, uh, the core concept. Um, 
when people exit or deprioritize family units that are based off of biological or legal ties, they build and seek comfort in chosen families. And the main focus of our presentation. How does one come to adopt these values? Through the public schools. Through the schools. They're teaching this in the public schools beginning when these kids are five years old. The kids that are graduating from high school and college today, there has never been a time where they haven't been educated in this ideology. How do they come to adopt these values? The public effing schools. Presentation. So this is a term that's used in queer and trans communities to describe the diverse range of family groups that are constructed by choice rather than through biological or legal ties that provide intimacy. Nope, no way to deprogram them. Too late. Not going to happen. Anything that someone learns before they are eight years old is almost impossible to change. It's not impossible, but it's like really, 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 really really, really hard. So is there any way to deprogram an entire generation? Nope. The conservative right allowed the schools to be taken over. They did nothing but re and complain and whine and cry and pretend to have an opposition when in fact all the Daily Wire was ever doing was shilling for Israel. All a lot of these conservative influencers and outlets were ever doing was shilling for Israel. That was really all they fucking cared about. And in the meantime, the schools got taken over and kids got indoctrinated and no one did anything but re and re and re and re and re and whine and complain and whine and complain and Trump's not going to save you either. This is the cost of not doing anything. Care, support, and mutual. Hang edit. on, hang on. Gabs deprogrammed her daughter who got sucked into gender ideology when she was 14 or 15 years old. It's not the same thing as what I'm talking about, Tayton. Completely different circumstance. These chosen families are one form of emotional and cultural nourishment among many. So to borrow a metaphor from the feminist economists, J.K. Gibson Graham, they exist within a sustainably diverse ecology of relationships and family forms. They can supplement strong bonds with parents, siblings, and others. Or and by the way, and we're going to listen to this slide again, because I don't really think anyone is actually listening to it, except I'm trying to, but we're not. Anyway, um, I want to say one more thing about what I just said. The way that Gabs was able to deprogram her daughter from gender ideology was taking away the internet for literally years. That's how she did. Well, it's one of the things that she did. She took away the internet. She moved her to a completely different state. She got her enrolled in a completely different school. She was on that school like white on rice. Like what Gabs did with her daughter and what Gabs teaches parents to do is goddamn near impossible. And most parents are not willing to do it. Let me let me ask you guys this. Are you willing to take the internet away from your kids? If you have kids, are they on the internet? Are you willing to take it away from them? Are you willing to take away their phone? Are you willing to sit there and watch them every single night to make sure they don't go on the internet? Because that is what is required. That is literally what is required to deprogram your kids. Take away the internet. Don't allow them on the internet. Do not give them a cell phone with internet access. If they have a cell phone with internet access, you take it away. It if they have a laptop with internet access, you take it away. They're only allowed to do schoolwork while you are sitting there watching them to make sure they don't go on the fucking internet. You have to monitor what they do with their friends. You have to make sure you know all their friends. They're not allowed to go to their friends' houses. The friends have to come to your house, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is what is required. Most parents are not willing to do that. Most parents are like, but my kid's going to complain if I take away their phone. Well, yeah, they're going to complain because they're addicted to the phone. You probably shouldn't have given them the phone in the goddamn first place. But this is the situation that you find yourself. So if you are not willing to take the internet away from your kids, take the phone away from your kids, take the laptop away from your kids, constantly be monitoring what your kids are doing. Do not allow your kids to go over to the friends' houses where they can go on the internet there. If you're not willing to get your kids out of school entirely, homeschool them, 
or or if you have to put them in public school, be monitoring every single fucking thing that happens. I don't mean every once in a while. I mean every single day. If you are not willing to do that, then you cannot deprogram your kids. That is what is required. All right. Nope. No, you're not listening. You're not listening. See, this is the problem. Is conservatives, they start to go, they're like, I don't have to take the internet away. I can just give them a time limit. No. No time limit. No apps. No fucking internet. No internet. What did I say? Did I say they get 30 minutes on the internet? No, I said no fucking internet. This is not going to deprogram your kids. All right. I need everyone now to refocus because I want to listen to the actual presentation. These chosen families are one form of emotional and cultural nourishment among many. So to borrow a metaphor from the feminist economists, J.K. Gibson Graham, they exist within a sustainably diverse ecology of relationships and family forms. They can supplement strong bonds with parents, siblings, and others, or they can make up for any potential lack of support. So as queer and trans structures, chosen families also work to challenge white supremacy and the capitalist cishet patriarchy by embracing the variety of relationships and kinship structures that can serve our needs for intimacy and care. A living well is about more than our material needs. We have social, emotional, and communal needs as well. Uh, chosen families encourage us to think expansively about the types of spaces where these needs can be met uh, through movements, in the arts, in educational spaces. And these are the types of things that my amazing colleagues are going to be discussing next. All right, so um, thank you, Tim. Uh, so oh, basically, um, oh, what I want to talk oh, about a little bit was- Oh, wow. What is this symbol? Do you guys recognize this? What is this symbol on the left of this slide that is just so, like, perfect? Like, mwah. No, don't just say socialism. Specifically, what is this symbol? What is this symbol? That's the Democratic Socialists of America. So in a presentation given by a California community college, we have a literal slide with the symbol of the Democratic Socialists of America. Oh, you want to cry now? Do you want to cry because I told you to take the internet away from your kids? All right, bro, you're getting timed out. If you want to complain again and you want to act like a big shot again when you probably have a dick about this big, let's just be honest about it. Because if you're getting upset about being yelled at by a woman, probably this is what we're dealing with. You can take a little fucking time out. If you come back and you whine in my chat again, you're going to get banned. Guys, as a reminder, I have two rules in my chat. Number one, don't be a dick. You will not insult me. You will not insult anyone else in my audience. I can do whatever I want because you are in my house. But you will not come into my house and insult me. Number two, no whining. If I tell you to stop doing something, just stop doing it. I don't want to hear whining. I don't want to hear complaining. I don't want passive aggressive attacks. If you do that, I'm going to put you in a timeout. If you come back and do it again because you're still in your feelings because wah, wah, you're going to get banned. Because, uh, so what do I mean by liberation? So liberation um, gets used uh, uh, sort of, just sort of like thrown around a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, it can mean different things to different people. And, and one of the things that, that I want to talk about is sort of like how we, especially in higher ed, sort of uh, reproduce, help reproduce the things that um, Tim just talked about. Holy and shit. Uh, sort of question that. So, um, so the first thing that we have to do is, define the word liberation because it, you know if we let other people define it 
then it's going to be defined to reproduce uh, the things that uh, Tim just talked about. So uh, liberation here, uh, to me, means that we're all working collectively. This is both professors and students um, and administrators, everyone within higher ed, um, to guarantee us all <laughs> housing as a right. <laughs> oh, my as God. A right, oh, movement as a right. I think I just had an orgasm at what that guy just said. Did you guys hear that? We are all working collectively as students, as administrators, everyone in higher ed. Uh, uh. Right. Universal health care and universal child and elder care. All right. And uh, one of the reasons that that in the Please description here, uh, it talks capitalism. about the, the description of, of our talk, it talks about um, the idea that our queer and trans students hold the key to this, right, um, is because they do, they're already doing, right, this work. They're, they've, they've essentially um, changed uh, the social relations, right, the relationships between people that uh, reproduce that sort of toxic um, limiting um, heteronormative family that really is just uh, to reproduce capitalism. Um, oh, they're no, doing no. it already. Right? <laughs> that toxic, limiting nuclear family that is just meant to reproduce capitalism. This is the greatest presentation I've ever seen in my life. And by the way, let's think about this. How okay, so liberation means liberate oneself from capitalism. Housing as a human right means the state owns all the houses. You do not cap okay, let's go back. Capitalism, remember, is defined as private property ownership. Private property means your home, it means your land, it means any businesses that you own, it means your intellectual property, it means if you own like an apartment as a landlord or an Airbnb, it means your parental rights, and it means your individual liberties, okay? Look at what this slide says. What do I mean by liberation? Liberation means liberate yourselves from capitalism or private property. Housing as a right. What does it mean that housing is a right? It means the government owns the housing and they give it to you. You do not own the housing. What does food as a right mean? It means the government controls the food supply and they give it to you. What does movement as a right mean? It means the government controls where you can travel and who gets gas and who doesn't. Universal health care. The government controls all health care, no private doctors, universal child and elder care. The government controls all care, no private nursing homes, no private child care. The government controls everything. Do you guys see? Um, so they hold the keys to their own liberation. And, you know, for thinking about sort of liberation also, um, and, you know, I'm going to talk about this in the next slide also, um, you know, uh, uh, liberation is not um, uh, uh, um, sort of like a charity, right? Um, you know, basically my liberation as a professor is actually wrapped up in my student's liberation as a student, right? And my student's liberation is wrapped up in my liberation, right? This isn't sort of like a, a top-down sort of charity thing that I'm doing for my working class students, right? We are in this together and our liberation um, is wrapped up, it is wrapped up in each other's liberation, right? There is no liberation for one until there's liberation for all, right? Um, so- uh, There is no liberation for one until there's liberation for all means that no one is free until everyone is free from capitalism. This is the same reason you saw queers for Palestine and everyone was so confused about why you saw queers for Palestine because they're like, if a queer person goes to Palestine, they're going to get thrown off a roof, which by the way, isn't actually true. But they didn't understand why queers were advocating for Muslims, right? The reason is that they see the uh, the uprising in Gaza to be the great rebellion against capitalism with Israel being the symbol of capitalism in that circumstance. 
because it's not Israel who's oppressed. It's the Palestinians who are oppressed and they are rebelling against the capitalist colonialist settlers. That's why they're called settler colonizers. Uh, colonization means to uh, to privatize indigenous land under the oppressive force of capitalism. Decolonization does not mean violent revolution. It means to uh, to to liberate the land that's been privatized under capitalism and return it to the collective, to remove capitalism from the land. So what they mean when they say, you know, I'm not liberated until my students are liberated and they're not liberated until I'm liberated. And, and when they're saying queers for Palestine, we're not free until everyone is free. They mean that no one in the world is free while capitalism or private property ownership exists in the world. So the next thing I want to talk about here is, is sort of focus on higher ed. <laughs> Um, Paolo Fieri. Hello. Hello, Paolo Fieri. Hello. So we think about what is higher education's role in liberation, right? So for the most part, our role is to stop it, right? Um, education in general is used uh, within capitalism wow. to reproduce the social relations that are necessary for capitalism to keep going, right? So essentially, and when I'm talking about capitalism, basically what I mean is that you have a large um, working class who works um, and basically is, is trying their best to, to get by. It's very hard for them to get by. Um, all of the resources that they produce, right, get pulled. Tayton says they hate homonormativity. It wasn't. Yeah, so homonormativity is basically the gays assimilating to like a normal capitalist lifestyle. Homonormativity, guys, if you don't know, it it, it means that um, gay people getting married and settling down and buying a house and having 2.5 kids and just doing all the things that the normal straight people do. They don't like that either. Pulled up into uh, what's called the bourgeoisie, which is sort of a minority of people, basically the the, you know, the, the people who own, uh, you know, what Marx called the, the means of production, right? So the, you know, Bezos and, you know, all, all of those, right? I, I always go back to Jeff Bezos. You just gotta love the, the mic drop of Marx and the bourgeoisie. <laughs> this is the most socialist presentation ever. Because here in the Inland Empire, um, you know, hang on. Suck on this, James. Suck on these clips, James. <laughs> Thank you, Human Centipede. I appreciate it. You know, he's the, the main um, employer here. Um, so, so for the most part, higher education is used to reproduce capitalism. Um, however, if we think about, especially stuff that's been going on lately, right? Um, education is not sort of this top-down thing. It's actually this space that, um, uh, that where um, uh, capitalism can be challenged, right? And if we think about <laughs> some of the, the, the stuff that's going on. Education is a space where capitalism can be challenged. Oh, Victor's so getting laid tonight. Victor is so getting laid tonight, like he has never gotten laid before. I'll tell you that. Florida, the Don't Say Gay bill. Um, they have some sort of like no woke bill or something like that. Um, you know, and then even and that's Republican, but even in Democratic states, the you know the way that California disciplines the community college is through the purse strings, right? So so what are we going to sort of uh, pay you for, right? Um, and we're going to look at things like you know how many of your students. Uh, not only graduated, but transferred. Um, what are your students, you know, the students that went to your university or your college, you know, what, what are they making five or 10 years down the road? Are they making more money than they made before they came in, right? We're gonna take all of those things into consideration when we're deciding your funding, right? So, so, uh, so education is not sort of this thing where it's automatically reproduced. We, we have to be disciplined and regulated in different ways. So with that being said, there's then space, right, for radical educators to sort of move in the other direction, right? Radical educators, anytime you hear the radical in this context, it means socialist. Yeah, who needs those kosher dildos from, uh, or butt plugs from Rabbi Shmuley? I've got socialists, man. I don't, I don't need no kosher butt plug to keep my marriage alive. 
<laughs> I just watch socialism and then I and then I and then I leave and Victor's lying naked in the bed and we just like okay it's like it's just like he because he knows <laughs> he knows where to be after happy hour education is another aspect of social reproduction theory Fieri and Giroux focused on it as abolishing the family well and this is this is why james claims that he has talked about social reproduction theory because james has talked about the reprodu the problem of reproduction in in um in in concert with what he's done on fieri and education but i'm sorry to say that to say that james lindsay has covered social reproduction theory because he's talked about the problem of reproduction in relation to the schools is absolute bullshit and I know you know that, Rottweiler. But, like, social reproduction theory is so much more far-reaching than the problem of reproduction within the Marxification of education. And so one exception here was Paolo, uh, Paolo Freire, and I apologize, I always mispronounce his name. Um, he was a radical educator who believed that education could lead to socialist revolution. Um, he wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed and lots of other books. But Pedagogy of the Oppressed, it's one of the most read teacher handbook texts for professors. And basically, in the <laughs> students watching this, if you do yeah. a lot of group work in Sold your class, all the like, you conferences. Work again, oh my God, right? You can thank this guy, all right? And basically, what he, he believed in what he called dialogical relations, which basically was the idea that if teachers and students are talking in groups about problems, right, um, you could work through the problems and move towards more socialist solutions to those problems and essentially uh, use education to, um, at one point, overthrow capitalism. Um, his work is not what? actually used for that, if you think about it. Did he just say you can use education to overthrow capitalism? I'm sorry. Um, you could work through the problems and move towards more socialist solutions to those problems and essentially uh, use education to, um, at one point, overthrow capitalism. Oh, my God! Um, his work is not actually used for that. If we capitalism 20, Gnosticism 0. Suck a dick, James. We're, we're less than 15 minutes into this presentation, by the way. This is a full hour. We still have 75% of this presentation to go. No, not, I mean, some of them are. Some Socialism Saturday streams are very, very juicy. Like, Socialism Saturday is usually, um, this is not hardcore socialism. Like, it is, it is, but this is like, Socialism Saturday is even more leftist than this. We think about sort of his work today, for the most part, it's used to reproduce capitals rather than foster socialist revolution. Yo. And basically the, the, you know, if we think about it, so, so we put you in group work, right? Yes. I'm talking to the students now. We deserve um, the treat. We put you in group work as students, right? Not to think we through, you know, how to, uh, how to use the keys you already have to, you know, produce, you know, uh, universal housing or anything like that, right? We, um, we put you in groups to work through um, whatever you need to work through in the class to get you the grade that you yeah. need. To get you the <laughs> yeah, Victor is the, is the real winner today. <laughs> he just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the stream and be like, Victor, take off your pants. <laughs> degree that you need to then essentially Watch, break he's gonna off call me an alcoholic as individuals actually. again onto the labor market and compete. He, he's going to, he's going to be like, Carlin yelled at me. She's an alcoholic, even though I've had like half a beer. <laughs> Just wait for it. I'll tell you. With each other for I know these conservatives. Um, uh, a decreasing amount of jobs, right? As capitalism matures, um, you get less and less, there's less and less work. All right. So, um, so we essentially reproduce it, right? Um, Bro, I yelled at you before I had even had any of this beer. So just to be clear, you were being an asshole. If you continue to be an asshole, we're just going to remove you and you will not be here anymore. 
It's your choice entirely. But if you want to continue with the backhanded fucking insults and the passive aggressive bullshit, I will just fucking ban you. Oh, shit. God damn it. Where the fuck was I? See, got all screwed up. Cons uh, good enough. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Tim. Buen dia a todos. I'm Brian Keen. My pronouns are he, el, they, a. Not actually used for that. If we yeah, think about okay. sort of jobs, right? As capitalism matures, um, you get less and less, there's less and less work. Thank right? you, bot. So, um, so we essentially reproduce it, right? Um, and so, you know, the reason that, that I'm bringing this up is because as educators, I'm talking to, to educators, um, we have to decide which direction we're going to go and when our queer and trans students come in holding these keys, right? What are we going to do? Are we going to actually um, work with them towards their liberation? Or are we going to sort of the way that we've done with Briere's work, reroute these impulses to then reproduce capitalism, right? Um, and then I'm going to introduce uh, the next presenter here, which um, Dr. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Tim. Buen dia a todos. I'm Brian Keen. My pronouns are he, el, they, a, he. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Before going into anything, Rob, I'll have a series of sort of animations that will come up. I'll cue in a moment, but could we just get a, a sign with the various emojis? How many students do we have in this space today? Because we're gradually moving into a conversation that I hope will engage students as much as our faculty, classified professionals, and others. So with emojis, can I see that we have any students in the space? Yes, several are popping up. Great. Awesome. Thank you all for being here, because, of course, part of our goal in organizing was to think about ways uh, that you already bring the keys for the liberation, uh, for your own liberation in these classrooms. If wow. we can move one forward, um, and actually two forward, Rob, that would be great. It'll bring up the quote and the identifier. If I had to ask you to name a queer individual from the past, you could no doubt identify people from the 20th century. If I ask you to think beyond the 20th century to the very distant past, indeed to the origins of human uh, existence on this planet, it might be more challenging. I wanted to begin with a quote from Carolyn Dinshaw, who's a queer theorist and a medievalist, a field of study that is near and dear to my heart, that represents a period between Rome and the Renaissance, a period that is getting a lot of uh, reimagining today. She says that we can forge dynamic relations to the past, even the distant or unfamiliar past, even if at present we do not know where such relations will lead. Using ideas of the past, creating relations with the past, touching in this way the past in our efforts to build selves and communities now and into the future. For many of us, we first learn about our sexuality, our gender identity, through images, through stories about other people. Sometimes, if we're fortunate, these stories have been passed down to us by members of our community, members of our family, but far too often, we find ourselves hiding in libraries or in bookstores or gas stations or online apps uh, and, and, and various platforms to find information that might help us figure out who we are, to come to terms with our identities and to give us language to know how to describe who we are. Carolyn Dinshaw's model is that by knowing about the pasts of many people across the planet, we can form communities that help us better understand who we are and to build those communities now and into the future. As an art historian and museum professional, I think often about how still we have to work against the kind of heterosis models that have been described by my colleagues and that we'll continue to discuss to resist narratives that still too often marginalize a majority of our population. That is to say that there are vast histories of queer and trans presence back to the beginning of life on this planet. Anthropology knows this, history of science knows this, various humanistic disciplines know this. Any history or coursework in our classrooms that does not acknowledge our presence in the past is anachronistic and harmful. If we can get the next two um, animations, Rob, when I visited the History Museum in Stockholm, the director proclaimed with a full-throated statement that if you don't know you have a past, it can be hard to imagine a future. So moving to the next slide, what does all of this have to do with chosen families, with our kinship groups? One of the models that comes up in studies about uh, queer communities, trans communities, and our chosen families is the idea of generational memory. And for the next animation, Rob, 
part of what we're contending with as a community is a lost generation. Some of this lost generation is an entire history of our race, of our gender, of our gender identity, expression, or sexuality. In other instances, it is the very literal generation of men, women, intersex individuals, queer and trans people, especially communities of color, indigenous groups around the world that were lost during the outbreak and continued suffering and struggles with HIV and AIDS, even into the present. That sense of loss brings with it trauma, feelings of grief, feelings of guilt, but also in some cases, feelings of joy for survival. A model for chosen family is to remember all of our ancestors, however we identify, and finding out who those ancestors are and telling their stories. For the next one then, Rob, we can borrow from an indigenous way of knowing and a model of storytelling. It's important as much to live within the moment, to remember those individuals by name, by experience, by identity and so forth, and to pass those stories on, to bring them into the present, to not forget. Indigenous- Pop quiz, why are they talking about indigenous ways of knowing in this presentation? Any ideas? Why do socialists always revert back to indigenous ways of knowing? Yeah, this sand slime is really good, but I got to tell you, this sand slime has got a really addicting texture. I really am enjoying it quite a bit. Back to our pop quiz. Why are they referring to indigenous ways of no Ooh, human centipede. Because the indigenous was before colonization. Colonization means to oppress the land under the oppressive form of capitalism. Yup, indigenous didn't really believe in binary gender, so they like that. Because indigenous people didn't have what they define as capitalism. Yup, pre-colonization. Indigenous people are pre-capitalism. Indigenous people were socialists, exactly. Indigenous is uncolonized. You guys are so good. Pre-capitalism. Prior to being colonized. Indigenous. So, so good, guys. I haven't, I haven't even asked that question before. Well done. They're implying pre-capitalism, so it's better. They think that indigenous populations were communal in nature, so they should be followed. Yup. Because the current ways of knowing is under capitalism that supports capitalism. Yup. Because they were unmolested by the capitalist colonial uh, colonizers. Exactly. Very good. Scholar Eve Tuck says, we have to as much remember the damage that has been done historically, remembering instances of prejudice and persecution of the past that is as much at play in the present. But we also have to not forget to celebrate moments of desire, of joy, of ecstasy, of orgasm, to remember that orgasm. we as queer and trans people are sentient beings that feel as much the pain and the pleasure um, as all those around us. And so for the next one, looking at artist communities, we learn a number of models already that take place in our college settings. We have mentorship models, we have apprenticeship models in the arts uh, that can be brought forward in queer and trans spaces so that we create the storytelling. Speaking of orgasm, if you have not mounted the like button yet, I really think that now is the proper time to mount the like button and you can do whatever you want to the like button. The like button fully consents. You can whip the like button. You can spank the like button. You can peg the like button. You can do whatever you want. Just do something to that like button for me, please. I appreciate it. Thank you mechanisms that we wish to bring forward. We have to create radical spaces on our campuses to disrupt normative uh, identities and spaces oh to be my. present in meetings <laughs> where we might not otherwise have been given space or voice. A lot of that oh, work falls baby. to us as educators, as classified <laughs> professionals, those that have any ounce of
privilege or space to be able to bring forward our stories, realizing that this might in some instances mean that we put ourselves out there. As an untenured faculty member, I'm still grappling with how to do this in an effective way. And I'm glad that I see this is being recorded, but I've stated my concerns here. A few of the works that are on screen are by David Wojnarowicz, the upper left, who declares his I mean, concern that this to, boy that you see before you no. should have died. This boy should have died of many things, of bullying, of family abuse, of trauma, of drug use, but he did not die of AIDS. Jeff Gibson, the Choctaw Indigenous artist in lower left, creates a beadwork collage that says, uh, that talks about the chosen family, that we choose our communities. And then our communities of color, uh, those that were working with Andy Warhol in the spaces that he created, and then black artists, Ajamu and Sir Rodney, have spoken about this long history of trauma that must be remembered, but not forgetting the desires and the goals of communities who continue to live and bring forward the memories that even though our communities have experienced loss by death, they are not gone. For the next and final slide then, Rob, in my last two minutes, I wanted to make an additional statement about ways that we can move forward using the collective and activist model. So for the next animation, what is that Thank stuff you. on the bottom? Today? Um, activist work is multi-generational. This is something we know. We have to acknowledge and we have to realize that some of this work might be slow, but the slowness is often baked into the institution. Whenever I hear that the process is going to be long and slow, I push back and ask why. What are we doing to make this process long and slow? How can we act more quickly because of the urgency okay. uh, of the lives that are at stake, especially <laughs> our queer and trans colleagues, especially <laughs> communities of color? For the next one then, Rob. I'm being completely inappropriate in today's presentation. We also have models in our classrooms and our campuses that follow the community of practice where we're in constant dialogue, constantly checking ourselves to make sure we're up to date on current thinking, being in brave spaces to have challenging and critical conversations. We see the artist workshop model is another one with each image that is on screen. These are communities that have questioned the institution, that push back, especially against funding structures, political regimes that are in power that need to be questioned and need to be quickly taken down the point that we've already heard, they've been coming for us and they will come for us and we can stand together united to push back. And for the final point, there are spaces like museums that are responding to the now. Social media has been a great platform to reveal the inequities in our institutions. And I would encourage all of us in our capacity as educators and students to use those same mechanisms that we see in activist communities to call into conversation our leaders. And after calling them into conversation, we may need to engage in some calling out for our own continued liberation. And with that, I introduce Professor Deborah Brown. Thank you all. Thank you, Brian uh, and Rob and Tim. This has been wonderful. My name is Dee Brown. Uh, my pronouns are she and they. Wow. And we're going to sort of go on a slightly different tack um, and discuss some of the realities in, in, in campus space, what this actually looks like when we use some of the theory and some of this radical liberatory thought um, that has been discussed. Um, to really bring that activism into our own spaces and, and build larger networks, right? And so I wanted to start with an idea that really stems from a creative um, collective in New York that actually holds a kinfolk festival every year. Um, and they created a definition, which I think is really helpful as a starting point to, to really bring in this idea of kinfolk and really also bring in folks of color um, into this conversation. So kinfolk, the idea is that it's a collective, a squad, a crew, a team, a fam, a chosen family, a kindred group um, below. Exactly. Kinfolk is the chosen family. So kinfolk is going to be the opposite of the nuclear biological family. It's going to it's going to be what they use to replace the nuclear family. Loved folks, us, they, um, and really it ties in my mind together as an idea that queer family is not rooted only in those that are related by blood, um, but it's this chosen family group. Obviously. Um, and that we give each other the strength to be our truest, unapologetic selves. We give um, ourselves the strength to, to bring and bond together in that space. Um, and when the rest of the world doesn't want us, when we have been um, sent out of our own families um, or not accepted, as who we are as our truest selves and our own family, um, 
groups that there is a space for us and there's a network um, for us with these folks, right? With our kin folks. It's the people who see us for who we are and aren't afraid to love us in that space. And this loving network really makes us kin folk. So they're accepting, they're affirming, they're non-monogamous. Yeah. So so polyamory is like a really big thing among socialists. A lot of them engage in it. Now, I want to be clear about this. Not all polyamorous people are socialists. I know plenty of polyamorous people that are absolutely not socialists, but a lot of socialists are polyamorous. So it, it's one of the ways in which they queer the nuclear family. And you have towns like uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, which is about 40 minutes south of me, um, is a great example of this. Somerville, Massachusetts has passed like legal protections for polyamorous couples. They passed uh, like insurance benefits for polyamorous couples. It's like the polyamory capital of the world. There are, there's, <coughs> excuse me, hang on. <coughs> Goddamn. There's um there's a project I want to work on for the Substack and Bot and I had started looking into this where there's all of these queer polyamory therapists all over the country and it's like and Bot can testify to this it is some of the craziest shit you've ever seen in your life the queer polyamory therapists that like they exist to be able to help polyamorous couples be polyamorous but it's like they're specifically marketing themselves as queer the therapists are weird AF. It, 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 it's some of the funniest shit you've ever seen in your life. I want to make a whole list of like queer polyamory therapists. Anyway. Right. This idea that we're <laughs> doing that work. And for me, you know, I'll bring in something a little bit personal for me. I found that space when I was coming out, when my dad said that, you know, mentioned Bible scriptures and said I was going against I'm almost done my first everything year. that this I, great. I, you know, learned. My mom walked away from me and my siblings stopped talking to me once I had um, a partner that was a woman. And so. Um, Does everyone wear a black wedding ring? I mean, I have a black diamond in my engagement ring. Like, what's wrong with a black wedding ring? I've never seen that. Um, I relied very heavily on my chosen family network, on my kinfolk when I was having a hard day, when I needed something, um, when they needed something, I would just be a listening ear or try to help them. Um, times when they would sleep on my couch, somebody needed something. And that is really that personal experience is what drives my work in community and in the classroom and on campus, right? And hopefully that's something that that will bring, even if that's not your experience and your struggle, that some of those ideas can be utilized to take the theories and move them into praxis or practice, right? How do we start building these communities? Um, All right, time for beer number two. I'm going with the peanut butter cookie stout with lactose. Snack time. If you're drinking something fun, let me know in the chat. No, we're not going to get to three beers. Only two beers will be sufficient. Thank you. Um, and, and community programming to support the building of kinfolk networks. Um, my beginning actually started not very far from where Juan is. Um, I started as an adjunct lecturer at San Francisco State University. Um, San Francisco in State. History, Women and Gender Studies and Sexuality Act Studies. And I taught funded. the Intro to Queer Studies class. I taught the Intro to Sexuality Studies class. Um, and strangely Here. enough, when I started working there in 2010, there was no center, there was no lavender graduation, and there was really no infrastructure for LGBTQIA2 plus students. Um, and most people were like, well, you're in San Francisco, just go to the Castro, <laughs> go figure it out. And I was like, this True. is not enough, right? We need to do work that might be happening in community spaces on campus, right? How do we start doing oh, that work here? I didn't know this. A black ring is an open relationship symbol? I didn't know that. Pro, pro tip, Milo. How do you know that, Milo? Not judging. Everyone likes what they like. And I was lucky enough because I was teaching these classes, right? And again, building curriculum helps to find students, right? If there is a queer class, I guarantee you LGBTQIA2 plus students will find it and will want to take it. <laughs> and it's a great way to start building that community within that space, okay? Um, and students just started kind of coming to my office and hanging out, 
right? Um, and they would go through their process and they would find each other in these spaces. Um, so actually, Rob, you can go to the next This smells um, so slide. peanut butter, it's glorious. Thanks. And so, yeah, again, with the idea of how do we build these chosen family spaces on campus, the first thing was to build intentional spaces. And so for me, that first intentional space, why? Cute, queer and trans, Quans Chrismica. That's a mouthful. Quans Chrismica. Okay. Ella was a lecturer at San Francisco State. Was it Why is Kwanzaa first? What is what is the rationale of the order on Kwanzaa Chrismica? My office, right? If you needed to come because you were having a rough day, like there would be space you could pull up, open a book, and sit on my floor, right? Um, and um, eventually, right, we want to get to a place where we have intent. Well, this is another good question from from uh, from Steve. Why is this only queer and trans? Where are the where are the lesbians and the gays and the bisexuals? Hmm. Intentional spaces on campus um, where beyond just right the as as Bambi mentioned, as many of us have heard. 10 spaces, 10 center spaces on campus is not enough. Um, but even if you are not in a space where you have a center space, um, you might already have folks that are doing some of this kinship building in student clubs or in some classes that might focus on gender and sexuality. Those are great starting spaces, right? Things that you can do as a community member, uh, whether it's classified professionals or faculty or students, right, is say, we want to set up an hour or two hours a week of space that's just for us, that we have a specific space that isn't and isn't even concerned about what the allies are doing, what everyone else is doing, that it is a space where we can talk about our existence and the realities, right, um, of what we've gone through, right? And I think that space idea is tremendously important. One of the things you see actually in this festival is that we created a space um, where we say it's okay to not allow people in because we're not here to do work to take care of you. This is a space. So it's okay to be exclusionary? I thought we were being inclusive. Why is it okay to not allow people in? It's all, You only have to be inclusive if you're heteronormative. Is that what I'm hearing? That's interesting on taxpayer money. In this festival is that we created a space um, where we say it's okay to not allow people in mm. because we're not here to do work to take care of you. This is a space that's for us. Yeah. And we are desperately in need of a space where we feel safe or at least safer with folks that are also in the struggle, right? Revolution. And in terms do of programming, right? If you can't do something like a, an intentional space every week or once a month, which is again, one of those community. Oh yeah, we're going to spy stream this whole thing. Guys, if you just joined us, this is this is from a conference that took place two years ago. It's basically um, it's sponsored by the chancellor's office for all of the community colleges in California. So congrats, California. This is your you're funding this bullshit. But their their conference for 2024 is coming up in about a month and I've already registered for it. We're spy streaming all of it and there ain't nothing they can do about it because I can get as many people to register for it as I want whatever no big deal community ideas that you can utilize also programming ideas at times when it's very very difficult for our queer trans and gender we're gonna do this for students, two straight days um around big holidays right um around breaks in the semester and because it's in california i will not have to get up early for it which i'm really excited about because usually when we spy stream conferences they're on the east coast and then I have to get up at like eight o'clock or something like that. And that's just not fun for me. But in California, I don't have to worry about it when it's on California time. Anyway. Um, where you can actually plan something of what, what we used to do when I was at San Francisco State is we would have uh, folks over for an unthanksgiving dinner um and yeah. well th well this is probably true this is probably true some fucking conservative influencer who's watching right now because they all watch me but they pretend they don't watch me like they're gonna magically discover this conference and pretend that i wasn't the one who handed it to them on a silver platter 
Exactly. Just again, to have the ritual and have people have a place to go on a day when it could be very difficult, right? Because you might not be connected or even allowed or even have any ties to a blood family. So, um, or a, you know, a Kwanzaa Chrismica event, right? Something around kinfolk lunches and dinners. I always think breaking bread is important, uh, maybe because I like food too much, but, uh, <laughs> but the idea that you can actually bring in like food and eating and have folks do some of that. Um, and also have oh, things like healing, I agree. Right? like that you're going to sit and maybe, maybe somebody food. really is into crystals. Maybe somebody has some other healing, you know, chants, yoga, whatever it is, but ways that you can say, we're going to build community in a space that's focused on healing. Cause we know we're dealing with trauma. Right. So that idea. And then the last My slide, purple. Last two slides. Um, and a quick note about queer and trans folks of color. Um, I did want to mention, um, I think it's tremendously important, 70% of LGBTQIA2 plus students in the CCC are BIPOC. Um, it's something that was mentioned to us by Chancellor um, Ortiz Oakley in 2019. Um, and I assume those numbers are um, still true. And I think that, you know, again, a mission should- all Hang on. Elon says, I live in New York state. I have to go down to the city and see if they, yeah. So go, go see if they were, you, you should pay them a visit and like take pictures of everything. If you go, if you go and uh, hang out with the communists, take pictures, record everything. They would love it. Apparently the communist, apparently I heard yesterday, the revolutionary communist party of America is like trying to get in touch with me. I don't know what, I don't know what that's all about, but I'm sure it's a really good idea for me to be cavorting with the communist party of America also be to center and exalt the experiences of queer and trans folks of color um, within these spaces. Um, and that includes, again, doing things like healings, bringing things that are specific I to just want to go to their market. And allowing space for Q QTPOC to have their own space and time, right? I know some campuses, they have um, QTPOC groups, um, meeting times that are really only for those folks and put up signs that say, it's okay that this space is only for these folks. Right. Don't again, it's, a, it's an, the idea about being unapologetic. I don't need to apologize for not letting some folks in because there is an active process where you have to deal with heteronormativity and racism and sexism and whatever else goes on. We don't have to right? apologize um, for not being inclusive. Where you're Everyone having to do a lot of work to, apologize to manage for not being folks inclusive. that aren't part of that struggle. And so creating a space is also important but for not building us. Um, on We're your allowed to be hypocrites. So if you go to the last slide. Um, and it really reiterates the idea, why do we need these spaces? Why do we need our own spaces? Um, because we want folks to gather. We want folks to feel free away from those mainstream stereotypes, marginalizations that we've heard about already today so that they can occupy a space that is for themselves. Um, the and even if you have center hands. spaces, oh, no take some time and say this chunk of time is going to be for these folks oh, no. so if they want to come into this space and have a meeting or do something um i imagine you will see students that want to come into that space i know we've had a number of of, of students uh, pr primarily i would say um students of color that are showing up in our center space um but again in integrated spaces you were consistently dealing with patterns of heteronormativity gender binarism and white dominance that you are gender binarism and white dominance. to manage, right? In a space that is specific for QTPOC. Hang on. The writing on this is small. I just want to read it real quick. Da -da 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 -da. In integrated spaces, patterns of heteronormativity, gender binarism, and white dominance are inevitable. Valuing and protecting spaces for people of color is not just a kind thing that white people can do to help us feel better. Supporting these spaces is crucial to the resistance of oppression. We ask allies participating in queer and trans and queer and trans people of color events and programming to be mindful of the space they take up and prioritize the voices of queer and trans and queer and trans people of color only. You are building a network and a community that is on a common ground where you're not having to deal with that, okay? So, sorry. Um, and so just having some of the events that are there, I think is really important. Um, sorry, uh, really important for um, creating an important, you know, sort of foundation for kinfolk networks. So that was, that was my piece.
And I will now uh, give the floor to Wendy Silva. Thanks, Dee. Um, Y'all can mark off the your bingo sheet, the background noise, right? <laughs> You're good, Dee. You're good. Um, so my name is Wendy Silva. I'm an English professor at RCC. My pronouns are she or they. Um, and so I kind of want to start by just talking about that statistic. Pop quiz for the chat. Why does someone use she, they pronouns? Why might a person choose to use she, they pronouns? Because if they're a she, that would mean that they inherently wouldn't be a they. Because they is a reference to non-binary, but she is a reference to the gender binary. Well, no, but but if they use she, they're not non-binary, right? Because she is she is binary, they them is non-binary. To show that they are a socialist. Because they're dipping their toe into socialism. They're virtue signaling that they're they're queering themselves. Exactly. To be queer is not to be trans. To be queer is not to be gay. To be queer is only to uh, adhere to a far left political ideology. You don't need to be gay to adhere to the queer ideology. You don't need to be trans to adhere to the political ideology. All you need to do is say you're queer. If you are a straight, cisgendered white man, you can still be queer just by saying you're queer. It's a signal to their queerness. They're a queer Marxist. They are queer. They're queer. Because they goes, well, but they're still she, though. A she, they. Exactly. Nope, this is not correct. This is not correct. They're not claiming womanhood. That's not right. They identify as queer. They're queer activists. It's about solidarity. They're a very good, Joseph. They're a comrade. Well done. That D just mentioned about 70% of our LGBTQ plus students are students of color. And so um, at RCC, about 60, a little bit over 62% of our students are actually Latinx or Latinx students. Um, and so this is really important to this conversation because it gives us some cultural insights into how the majority of our students are understanding the concept of family, right? Um, outside of the nuclear family that Tim uh, talked about at the beginning. And so um, whether you know this or not, um, the majority of Latinx cultures really center family, right? Family is family, period, no matter what. And so sometimes students, um, are living in these toxic kind of family home situations and they where they don't feel they can get any reprieve from because family is family, right? We don't step outside of that. And so in order to be culturally responsive to our students, we don't want to like decenter the idea of family um, that is so highly valued in our culture, but instead we wanna be able to shift that model to help them understand that family doesn't just have to be those biological and legal ties that Tim had mentioned earlier. Um, and really, um, Latina families have been veering away from these from these traditional models, this this nuclear structure, um, for quite some time, especially really? in the immigrant and economically disadvantaged really? Latina populations, um, from which many of our students come. Hey, from. Look at this: familias decenter whiteness and helps them navigate higher ed. Do you think most most Latinos would agree that they're navigating away from the nuclear family? I don't know about that. They seem to be pretty effing Catholic to me. From, um, you know, our grandparents live with this. Our Theos and Theos are living with us. We have pretty most cousins living with us. But we I have live in New Hampshire. Families so living in know. one home, single parent homes, right? Um, so all of these different um, iterations of what a family can look like. So how can we bring this knowledge about our population at RCC or at your own schools? Um, to really value and be culturally responsive in our classrooms. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, my Puente class. So I'm the Puente- Hang on, Tayton says, let's see. Tayton says, no, they haven't. I work with a metric ton of Mexicans and they always put family first. I mean, that was my like perception of them, but 
I live in the great white northeast, and so I don't know. But thank you, Tate, and I appreciate it. Uh, English co-coordinator at RCC right now. Um, and if those are you, for those of you that don't know, Puente is a program that is Latina focused that really helps, really focuses students on transferring. We really want to get as many students to transfer to a four-year university as possible. Um, and it's a, it's kind of like a learning community model. There's a lot of different elements, but predominantly it's a learning community model. Um, they take the same English 1A class with the same group of students and the same instructor, and then they take English 1B, and there's some guidance courses that are paired with that as well. Yo, hang on, hang on, hang on. Pink Floyd says, if I was a traditional Marxist, I would be so embarrassed by these people. These people are traditional Marxists. The Communist Manifesto talks about abolishing the biological family. All of this is about abolishing the biological family. The chosen family, the queer family, the kinship of like the, the, the you know, kinfolk, establishing a family beyond biological kinship. This is all about abolishing the biological nuclear family and by abolishing the biological nuclear family is literally talked about in the Communist Manifesto. So these people are traditional Marxists. Um, so in this Puente class at the very beginning in the fall, students get assigned a familia. So it's a group of like four to six They're students assigning a who are going to be those students' familia, their family for wow. the entirety of the year. Um, and so these groups are really meant to be support for the students. That doesn't seem like a family of choice to me. Rottweiler says Latinos are way more family driven. Abolishing the family is not going as fast here. Oh, yeah. Rottweiler's in Mexico. Abolishing the family is not going as fast here compared to the Anglosphere countries, especially here in Mexico. Exactly students as they struggle not only with the culture shock of you know navigating higher ed and all it's everything that higher ed is um, but just their overall success in college right and these familias do this by first off decentering whiteness so we really oh. kind of talk about the collective nature of family and how these students are going to really depend on each other um, they have to for their success that they're going to work together to be successful together right there's not we're, we're pushing away from the competition and you all are trying to who can get the better grade or who what did you get on your paper it's like how can we all be successful in this class together um and it really helps them navigate navigate higher education so they get to learn about resources together um i heard just the other day students are like oh what are you going to do after class oh i'm going to la casa to study do you want to come and they're like yeah yeah i'll go with you right um i hear students telling each other about the promise program uh -huh. or other financial aid opportunities that they maybe didn't know about right um, i so wish i could do college over again i would do college so differently today than the first time I would still have a metric ton of sex. That was actually probably one of my best decisions in college. I don't think that was bad, but like there are so many things I would do differently. But I wouldn't want to go to college today. I would want to go to college when I actually went to college. Because the college I went to didn't have any of this woke bullshit in it. Because we had a conservative chancellor and I hated him at the time. He was an asshole, John Silber. Um, because I went to Boston University just like Nick Fuentes, but way earlier than Nick Fuentes. Um, Nick actually probably would have done better at Boston University when I went there rather than when he went there. But like, god damn. Hindsight is 2020. Um, they provide emotional support. So if they're dealing with breakups or stuff going on in, in their homes, um, you know, dealing with things that a lot of Latino families deal with. They, they can relate to one another. They can depend on each other for that emotional support. Yes. They provide each other academics. Yes. AOC also went to Boston University. So the people that have gone to Boston University are me, AOC, and Nick Fuentes. <laughs> oh, gosh. Totally worth it, though. Support. Um, they get to do like extra peer reviews. I know students that are texting each other like, hey, how does my thesis statement look? This is totally outside of class, right? They're just getting feedback from each other. Like, did I do my citation right? Am I, what was the website that Professor Wendy said in class that we should use to check our citations, right? So they have this extra resource with each other. Um, I actually even had a student in the fall who came to me and said, hey, I have two members in my familia who are really struggling with this first essay, but they're really embarrassed to talk to you. 
And so I was able to go and reach out to those students because a member of their familia told me they were struggling. Had he not done that, I wouldn't have known right until after they submitted their paper, right? And then they would have started to fall behind. So um, it's really helpful in those regards, filling in some of those gaps. Um, and of course, ultimately, they build really strong friendships. Um, and at first, you know, students are a little bit reticent to to be as open with this new group of people that they just met, right? But um, they they learn really quickly the value of having this really strong support network. Um, anytime a student is absent, we say, hey, you, you know, you can come to office hours to ask questions, but check in with your familia. And so students are like taking pictures of all the PowerPoint slides and they're they're getting them on Zoom so they can hear certain discussions and they're, the, the students themselves are doing that, right? Which takes actually a lot off my shoulders because students are depending not solely on me as the instructor, but we're distributing that power dynamic amongst ourselves and really kind of helping each other be successful. And they're helping me be successful as an instructor too, right? So it's that give and take. Um, and so, they really become they really tend to depend on each other in these small familias as part of that larger I mean they're basically training these people in like the family of choice you guys see this right in the community colleges which are funded by taxpayers they're training people to set up these families of choice which are um which are the alternative to the nuclear family Exactly. Your familia will keep you in line with the queer narrative or else your whole life is ruined. They're going to be the first ones to report you to the state and get a financial reward for it. Media structure in our classroom. Um, so my co-coordinator and I, we tell students from the day one that we are their family and we're going to be there for them. And then we do it. Right. And so our roles go far beyond just teachers of a specific subject. Um, we check in our, on our students' mental health. We check in on how the, what they're struggling with at home. We're checking and see how they're doing in their other classes, any challenges that they're facing. Um, and this model really works towards that liberation that Rob was talking about because it centers our students' cultural experiences and it values them in spaces that hasn't traditionally valued them. It lets them know that they're welcome as they are um, and that they do not have to let go of these different elements of their culture just because they're in this new space right and when students feel comfortable and welcome we know that that's that's the the perfect recipe for learning right um, rob next slide please gracias um and so i wanted to share some student voices here at the end um just kind of some um some voices of students who thought that the idea of familias in the class has been particularly beneficial to them and why. Um, so I'll share, I don't know if you all on your screen, mine's like blacking out parts at the top. So I'm gonna read the second and the third, um, the yellow and the orange ones, just to kind of bring our attention to some student voices. So one student said, my familia has helped me grow as a person. I only ever had two best friends, but when I got my second familia, I felt so much support. They helped me talk in front of the class, even though I was so scared to, which has helped in my success to feel more confident to speak more. Um, so this student is obviously highlighting the fact that this, that their familia helped them get more confident to speak, not only in our class, but in other classes, feel confident that what they have to say matters at all. Right? That is huge. That's far beyond what, you know, far more important to me than a student learning about topic sentences, right? This is really validating to their person, to their humanity. Um, and then the orange one, a student said, during the semester, my family helped me a lot with staying up to date on assignments. They would ask if we have assignments, if we've done assignments, it would remind me to do it. As well as introducing me to other classmates, which I now have a good friendship with, we have a bond growing out of the classroom. Since I'm not the most social person, I often will not talk to people. But with them, it has been great having that friendship. So again, feeling comfortable in the class to actually form these connections. Um, stepping out of the comfort zone, that green one, the students was saying how important it was that they stepped out of their comfort zone with their familia. Um, at the bottom, you know, feeling like they're not alone, feeling like this, the stresses that they're experiencing as a Latina student, their familia members are also experiencing, right? And so even though this information I'm sharing for, with Heaven's Gate was in San Diego. I actually didn't know that. They killed themselves over the Hale Bob Comet. Yes, they did. And you know what? You know, the other thing about Heaven's Gate is they were non binary, they didn't have a gender. And they castrated themselves. California. California ruins everything. They do. It's like they're trying to eliminate friend. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they are trying to eliminate friend. Well, it's not friend, it's comrade, right? Comrade is greater than friend.
because they're comrades. Comrade is like family. Comrade is superior to friendship, Steve. you is from my Puente class. Again, 70% of our um, LGBT students on campus are uh, students of color. And since we have a majority Latina students, we have a lot of those students in our Puente class, right? Um, and so yep. uh, by using funny Scientology yeah. started in California. I, I showed your I showed your Heaven's Gate chat. Was there more to it? Hang on. I've had a lot of beer already, so was there more to the Heaven's Gate thing? I don't see anything more to the Heaven's Gate thing, human centipede. Whatever. All right, let's see. We have about 10 minutes left of the presentation. I'm already good and drunk, so that's probably a very good thing. All right, let's wrap this up. Yes, we're helping all students understand that a family unit can and is who we choose to surround ourselves with, right? Um, and I've only been doing this model for one year, but I hope to start implementing it in all of my composition classes and especially in it more uh, um, intentionally in our rainbow learning community that we're gonna be launching at RCC this fall. It's gonna be a, a learning community that is based off of the Umoja and the Puente models. We're kind of starting with just the learning community piece and then hopefully scaling up as we go. I know, the new um, just But dropped. this chosen family piece is gonna Alice be very instrumental to our favorite. LGBT students. I'm hoping to do a unit on chosen families um, and really kind of use that Puente Familia model in this um, new rainbow learning community model. Um, that's going to be open to it's going to be open to everyone, but it will focus specifically on making the curriculum LGBT focused and it will be um, hopefully filled mostly with LGBT plus students um, and allies. That's that's our goal, at least. Um, yeah. Last slide, I think Do we have a last slide. The empty slide. <laughs> um, so thank you all of you for coming. We just wanted to open it up now for some questions or conversation oh, dialogue. Good, um, I know we covered a lot of things very quickly, um, but if anyone has anything to share or wants to type in the chat, I know Juan, you're gonna you're gonna moderate for us. Thank you. Yes, and thank you all um, for that. That was a lot to. Human Centipede says, "Know who is else created a family? Charles Manson, Jim Jones, Heaven Gate." Yeah, yeah, all the major cults. I want to watch, um, I don't know if I can get away with this on YouTube. I want to watch a documentary about, um, Jim Jones at some point. I used to be obsessed with Jim Jones and that whole thing. Like, it was an odd fascination. And this goes back to, like, when I was a teenager. And this, this really tells you that I was destined to do what I'm doing now. Cause when I was a teenager, I had an odd fascination with Jim Jones and that whole like people's temple bullshit. And I don't think I realized it was actually socialist at the time, but I just thought it was like weird and dystopian. And I've always liked weird dystopian things. We got to find a documentary to watch about that at some point. Cause that shit was crazy, yo. And I'm not just interested in the Kool-Aid bit. I'm interested in like everything, like how the F, how the like look and i feel like hindsight will be like 2020 on this one like how the f did jim jones get a significant number of people to move to guyana to start a socialist commune and then commit suicide i mean you got to admit it's like one of those things where it's actually like I can't get people to mount the like button on my YouTube video. This guy got people to move to a different continent to give up everything to sell. Like that's the type of cult leader that I really want to aspire to. I feel like I would be a good and benevolent cult leader. Like I'm not going to make you move to another continent or anything, but I'm just saying like, I want to be the type of cult leader that I can get you to sell all of your worldly possessions to give up everything, to move to a commune, and just do my bidding. I don't think I'm asking too much. Am I asking too much? I don't think I don't think I'm asking too much. I really I I don't. My commune will probably be in Sedona though, because I'm really not that motivated, and I like Sedona. 
to kind of process and unpack, but it's really important work. I, um, I myself have also done work in, um, <laughs> right. uh, right. with the concepts like, of uh, chosen family and chosen familia. So I really appreciate that. And, um, uh, I, I myself am trying to kind of unpack because I feel like I went on a total the voyage of, of, of theory and language. But um, if anything, I just I just really appreciate how y'all have been able to break down something that is so kind of abstract in within queer culture. Um, um, because at times we don't even know that we're participating in queer family, right? Or in kin with kinfolk, right? Like we we just kind of exist within our circles and that's how we survive, right? And so I think um providing access to a language and a framework is, is um, really important, especially for educators and, um, and students that are interested in kind of um, that, that type of community building. So um, I wanna go ahead and open up the chat for some questions. Also, if um, I do wanna be mindful and let y'all know that we have about eight minutes for the Q&A before eight we have to minutes. start wrapping up. So um, let me go ahead and start looking at the chat okay so it's um from tari it states uh i'm a white cisgender pansexual woman with many trans and non-binary friends um i want to bring safe spaces to my campus we have an lgbtq plus ally uh group but i uh, but i believe the trans non-binary need their own space how do i do that without being intrusive And I'll, I'll, I can, I can start with that one. Um, my, my thought, and, and again, it's one that, that I borrow from um, one of our classified professionals at RCC, who before we had a center was like, let's just rent space. <laughs> and so if you do have a space, it might be something like, we're going to have an hour or two that's set aside for these folks to take up space and putting a sign up and saying like, we're going to have a lounge or a happy hour or something like that, where trans and non-binary folks are welcome to come. There may be like a resource, something, right, um, to tie in, but it's not necessary to have a resource. I think just saying this is their space, right? Like we're- But here's what your job is gonna be on the commune because you are the chief investiga investigative officer. And so what I need you to do is I need you to just like keep an eye, like your job is basically gonna be to like rat people out who are trying to undermine the cult. I need you to sniff that shit out. I need you to do what you do where you go in and you're like, you're you're not saying anything and you're not really making yourself known, but you're just like paying attention to everything and you know everyone's business. And like, if someone is trying to undermine the cult, you need to come and tell me so we can make an example out of them in like a public, a public affair. That's your job. We're, we're making intentional time to show that that we care and they they have a visible something right um and and i always feel like that's a good starting point when i see somebody write on there that this is like qtpoc space i'm always like oh that's great like i want to see what that's all about because that's me right um and so that's you know for for some folks it's i think seeing and then for me in my experience it's definitely students start doing some of that work like we've seen students who have really taking on like, oh, we heard that you have this. And so we started building, you know, they they put together logos and they like drafted things by themselves. Yeah, if anyone undermines the cult, we're paddling them publicly in the public square. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be like that restaurant in Las Vegas, where if you go to this one restaurant in Las Vegas, <laughs> it's crazy. They, they basically like, if you go to this one restaurant in Vegas, it's like all of the foods. What the fuck is it? Someone knows the name of this restaurant. I know this. It's the restaurant where, like, they feed you all this, like, super fattening food, like, burgers and really bad. And you can get, like, the giantest burger in the history of burgers. And, like, but the deal is, whatever food you order, you have to eat all your food. And they actually send send women dressed up as nurses around the restaurant to make sure you eat all. Yes, the heart attack, heart attack grill. That's it. And if you don't eat all your food, they paddle you in the middle of the restaurant. That's going to be the punishment in my cult. And they're not fucking around with those paddles either. Like they actually hit. I'm not telling you how I know that. I'm just telling you that I know that.
themselves, right? Even when I was at San Francisco State, students were like, well, we wanna do this or we wanna do that. So once they kind of, you know, you end up building momentum once you do something as simple as, as, as saying, this is the time, right? Um, and hopefully like a college hour or something like that where it's accessible, right? Any other? Hmm. Trendle, and I'm gonna have to think about your job. I don't know. So somebody also shared a uh, YouTube link in there about a TED talk about chosen uh, families, I believe. So um, folks can access that for later. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So um, I'm looking at the time. Does anyone want to directly ask a question? Maybe raise a hand. Um, that's also an option. I think people look out here again, being mindful of time. Um, let's see. Um, Adrian. Um, sorry to interrupt. So, um, hello, my name is Adrian. Um, I am a student at OCC, Orange Coast Community College. And next semester, I'm planning on restarting the LGBTQ club at my campus that closed, oh. unfortunately, due to COVID. And what is something that you guys would recommend me kind of including or like kind of being aware of? Adrian you know, is so innocent. Next semester. Don't make fun of students, they're victims, please. Rob is the advisor of our student club. Rob, I don't know if you wanna jump in. Um, so yeah, so every school is different. Um, so is this person trans? This person kind of gives me trans vibes, but they also kind of give me like guilty white liberal vibes. I don't know. I can't tell. So the easiest way would be to Might see just be if soy. you have, um, so at, at, our, at RCC, we have what's called the ASRCC, which oversees all of the clubs. And Do they have an they Adam Apple? actually give you the information. Like, so, so at our school, it's like, okay, well, you have to have one full-time, uh, uh, faculty who's I think I saw an and then X number of students sign up, right? So they could give you the information that you would need um, to like to get that started. I I hope that helps. I because again every school is different, so you would have to. The easiest way would be to, you know, to to go, you know, to, to find out, uh, you know, to go onto to the website or whatever. It is like Pat. It is oh. Clubs, Right, and That's then what see I if you to can show. find sort it is of like, like that. Um, an umbrella organization. Yeah, Dahmer. Um, or mm -hmm. you know, True. if you can't, right, go to one of the clubs, and that you know, like like the the you know the advisor who's there already will know how to navigate that, and then and then you would just have to sort of do whatever your school wants. Does that help? It does. Thank you so much, Adrian. You might also want to look. Um, I don't know if your school does this, but we have like ally training at our school, and when they complete it, ally they training? get a sticker what and the they fuck? put it on their door. Oh, you get a so you sticker. can go to wherever, okay. like the faculty offices that are, and sense. see who has that sticker, who has something rainbow or something like a trans flag or something that's showing that there's there's an ally in that space. Um, those are probably the doors I would knock on first um, and kind of let them know what you're after. Um, if they are not ready to advise, they might know other allies who are or other people who are part of the community. Um, we have an out and proud list at RCC. So everyone who feels comfortable outing themselves to the community or outing themselves as an ally, we have like a list of everyone's names and department. I don't know if your school has something like that. Might be a good place to start looking for an advisor and getting, you want someone who's going to be like there for fighting for you, you know? So having that advocate advisor is going to be really key, I think. I'm not sure if we do have like a list on my campus, but I do know a certain, I know like my school's equity program has a lot of LGBTQ like workers and like a faculty. Um, Why are they whispering? We're kind of, I figured out like, we're kind of got inspired, you know, to kind of restart the club and, you know, um, make sure that people at I this campus, Adrian you know, are welcome, hurting. no matter what the sexuality or gender identity is. And yeah, thank you so much for all of the great advice. So um, does anyone else want to ask a question? We have maybe a, about a minute or two. Okay, any, uh, any final thoughts uh, for the panelists?
okay, <laughs> from the panelists, I mean. Um, <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, thank you all. Thank you for, uh, thank you again for, uh, for this presentation. It was really um, uh, informative <laughs> and, um, and super layered. I mean, it was, it was very wonderful. I'm, I'm looking forward to revisiting um, the recording. So- um, You're gonna go eat a big sausage, um, Terry? <laughs> you but, um, what a so again, uh, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate the knowledge our presenters have shared and the time <laughs> they have given to the summit today. As a reminder, session recordings will be posted in the app within two weeks after the conference, and the chat information will also be included. We ask that you complete the session survey listed at the bottom of the session in the conference app at this time. We, uh, we hope you have a great rest of the day planned. Uh, we have a great rest of the day planned for you. Um, and we will be moving to the next uh, session. I believe there's a break coming up. And then, um, and the links. All in right, that's that's enough for today. So we made it through the presentation. I have to say like the first 15 minutes of this presentation were fucking gold. It was everything I've ever wanted a presentation to be. It It said every quiet part out loud. I'm not saying the rest of the presentation wasn't good, but like, they really blew their load in like the first 15 minutes. It was one of those things where like they could have spread it out more, but no, they just gave it all there and whatever. I, I downloaded it either way. So it's, it, it's awesome. It, it's cool, man. Like this is a presentation from a conference that took place two years ago, uh, sponsored by the chancellor's office that oversees all of the community colleges in California. And guess what? Guess what? In less than a month we will be going to this year's summit because i've already registered because it's free not under my real name of course i'm going to get other people to register not under their real name of course we're going to be spy streaming their april 2024 summit for two days and there ain't nothing they can do to stop us because they put it all out in the public and we're going to take care of it all right so that's going to be really fun for all of us and yep I'm expecting uh, Victor to be like uh, naked in bed when I get out of this presentation. Cause I've like, you guys know how turned on I am when they say all of the quiet parts out loud. It's just like, I can't contain myself. Okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Victor's going to have a good night tonight. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. <laughs> you said it twice. <laughs> Two super chats for Victor. All right. He has got his work ahead of him. Um, all right, guys. That is all I have for today. I will be I will be back tomorrow and we will do Socialism Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, please mount the like button on the way out the door or spank the like button or peg the like button or or do whatever you want to the like button. It's fine. Whatever you want. I don't judge. We'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Guys, take care. Have a good one. We'll see you soon.